Continuing on with our trace minerals discussion, we're going to pick up this video with iodine, chromium, manganese, molybdenum, and fluoride. So what are these all used for? Well, you've probably heard of fluoride and iodine, but let's figure out the other three. To continue on trace minerals, we're going to pick up with iodine first. Now, you might have heard of iodine in conjunction with the thyroid. That's because iodine is essential for thyroid functionality. Without enough iodine, you cannot produce thyroid hormone. Now, thyroid hormone is going to deal with metabolism in your body. So it's kind of important to make sure you have enough thyroid hormone to help control metabolism throughout your cells. Now, if you don't have enough iodine, that can actually mimic and be just like selenium deficiency. So the two kind of have a similar take on each other. But in the case of a lack of iodine, that's considered a goiter. Now goiter is when the thyroid gland is going to enlarge because it can't get enough iodine. So it's trying to do this, trying to pull iodine, trying to get iodine, it's growing to get more, it just can't get it. So it causes elargeness in the neck that is considered a goiter. Now iodine is also going to help with the regulation of body temperature because metabolism makes energy, so therefore heat, as well as your energy levels, metabolism, of course. It helps to deal with brain growth and body growth overall because metabolism, you need the energy, you need the actions to occur. Deficiency in iodine for children, so especially infants, is called cretinism. So cretinism, not enough iodine, the body just can't properly form everything. You don't have proper growth, you don't have proper body portions, the brain doesn't grow properly, everything's just smaller at this point. So where do you get? Mostly things from the sea. Think fish and seaweed. You're saying, well, I don't eat a whole lot of that, but I'm still okay. That's because a lot of the salt that is used is iodized salt. The iodine has been added into the salt. So that's where majority of a lot of people's iodine comes from is that iodized salt. But how much do you really need? You need about 110 micrograms as an infant up to about 150 micrograms as an adult. So again, not a ton, but it has to be a constant consumption of iodine. Next up, we have chromium. Now, chromium isn't quite as well understood as the rest of the trace minerals. They're all trying to figure some things out here. But what they do know is it helps with the action of insulin. So pretty much it enhances what insulin does. That means it plays a role in carbohydrate, protein, and lipid metabolism. Because insulin is dealing with glucose regulation in the blood, remember. So insulin helps to reduce blood glucose levels, helping to maintain proper amounts and put them into storage units or have them go into metabolic processes like carbohydrate, protein, and lipid metabolism. Deficiency. Well, if you have a chromium deficiency, you're usually exhibiting a couple of different things. Could be some weight loss, could be peripheral neuropathy, that means any of the nerves coming off the spinal cord aren't quite firing properly. Elevated plasma glucose levels are possible. That goes back up to, remember, iodine, sorry, remember, chromium was helping with insulin. Or impaired glucose utilization. Again, insulin's not being properly functioning, which means you're not handling glucose properly. So where do you get it from? Meats, nuts, green vegetables is where your sources are. You're looking at your RDA of about 0.2 micrograms up to about 35 or 25 micrograms in adults. So 35 males, 25 females. Once you hit 50 and above, that RDA drops a little bit down. You don't quite need as much. Next one up, manganese. Now manganese is helping to protect from free radicals. If you notice, there's a lot of things helping protect you from free radicals. It's also going to be a cofactor in several different enzymes. 
things that are helping with carbohydrates and cholesterol metabolism, looking at bone formation, as well as urea formation. So cofactors and all these different parts, all of them important in own ways. Carbohydrate and cholesterol metabolism, well, sure, you have to be able to break down carbohydrates for energy. Cholesterol, again, breaking them down, utilizing. Bone formation, just like calcium and phosphate and all the other minerals we're talking about in vitamins, manganese goes into healthy bone formation. Urea formation. Urea is a way of your body getting rid of excess waste products. So it's important to make sure you can form that properly and then get that to the kidneys for excretion. Now, if someone has a liver problem, for example, that's going to cause a real problem here because then you can't detoxify the blood from levels of manganese. So it's kind of important to make sure you keep the levels appropriate and not getting too elevated by being able to clear them out as you need them. Now, while the deficiencies are rare, if deficiency does occur, looking at nausea and vomiting, poor bone structure, which makes sense because it helps to build the bones, as well as skilled hair and nail problems. So your skin, your hair, and nails just aren't quite forming properly if you have a manganese deficiency. Where do you get manganese from? Fruits, nuts, and legumes is your primary sources. You don't really need a whole lot looking at about, from infancy, 0 0.003, so we're talking tiny amounts for infants, up into adulthood, 2.3 for males, 1.8 for milligrams for females. All right, that's iodine, chromium, and manganese. All right, next up is molybdenum. Molybdenum is gonna be used for several different things. One thing that's primarily used for, though, is it's a cofactor your sulfur-containing amino acids. Think methionine and cysteine. It's going to actually help with methionine and cysteine metabolism in your system. It's also going to help with metabolism for nitrogen-containing compounds. Now, these nitrogen-containing compounds are things like DNA, RNA. So it's kind of important to make sure you're, again, healthy and producing your DNA and RNA. So where do you find this molybdenum? It's found in cereals, grains, nuts, legumes. But what's really interesting here is the amount that is found in those foods is dependent on where they were grown. The soil concentration will make a determination of how much gets into the actual plants. So you're looking at grains from point A and point B they might have two different concentrations of it, all depending on what was in the soil at that point. So how much do you need? RDA, looking at 17 micrograms up to 45 micrograms as the RDA. So infants 17, adults 45 here. Which brings us to our last trace element. The last trace element is going to be fluoride. Now you've probably heard of fluoride with your teeth. That's because that's one of the main places you'll have, have it being used. What happens here is fluoride is going to help your teeth stay healthy and then restore enamel when necessary. There's three main ways that this is helping and working. First off, it's blocking the acid formation by bacteria in your mouth. Without having as much acid formation, it can't damage the actual enamel of your teeth. Secondly, it's preventing the demineralization of the teeth. Without demineralizing, you're not losing the minerals, they can stay in the enamel, keeping it nice and hard and solid. Thirdly, it is enhancing the remineralization, so putting minerals back in, remineralization of destroyed enamel. Enamel is the hardest substance in your body. It's harder than your bones. So the idea here is, to keep that enamel intact, healthy, and functional by having enough fluoride in your body. Now, fluoride also helps in your bones, but usually you hear about it from the teeth. Quite often, though, we don't get enough fluoride in our diets, just not naturally occurring enough. So what happened is they started to fluorinate the water. They're adding fluorine 
into the water from municipal water sources. This has helped to increase fluoride intake for those that use the fluorinated water, the municipal water sources. That help to drastically reduce the amount of tooth decay and other tooth-related problems once different communities and countries that matter started doing this. Now, a word of caution here is if someone has a well on their property or they're not drinking municipal water sources, then you're not getting the same fluoride levels and you have to watch how much fluoride you have in your diet. So where do you find this though? Mostly from fish. Now it's not an RDA necessarily, it's more of an AI, an adequate intake, because most people get fluorinated water. You're looking at 0 0.01 milligrams from infancy, up to about four milligrams for males, three milligrams for females. So that is our end of the trace minerals. Gone through iodine, chromium, manganese, molybdenum, and fluoride. Until the next video.